Welcome to another web development podcast where we help aspiring developers get jobs and junior developers grow. And with me, I have almost all of my web development mentorship meetup mentors, but um, we'll actually kind of go around and um, if you want to give like a quick one minute introduction, that'd be cool. And then we'll go ahead and get started with the topics. But anyways, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Nick, if you'd like to jump in and get started. Sure. Um, so hi, I'm Nick Rodriguez. Um, I've been a professional software engineer for about three and a half years. I'm a graduate of the uh, Full Stack Academy of Code, which is a coding boot camp that started in New York and moved to Chicago in 2016. Um, I've kind of worked on all over the stack, uh, some front end, some back end, um, some infrastructure stuff. Um, done a little bit of a lot of things, uh, which, which I think is a ton of fun. But oh yeah, how was that done? Oh, that was good. That is going to be so much better than mine. Um, <laughs> so I, I've i been a developer for a few years now. I actually graduated from Full Stack Academy, which is really cool because all of us did. So we're all Full Stack Academy graduates. It's probably what I'm going to put for the title, to be honest with you. Um, but I worked three different positions, about a year at each position, um, all pretty much front-end roles with the third role dipping into a little bit more back-end, but it was still heavily front-end focused. Uh, but yeah, and then I, I basically, uh, I've been trying to build up my company and now it's starting to finally pick up, which I'm really excited about. Uh, but I do uh, coaching and uh, do a lot of development work on the side. And that's pretty much what I'm doing now. That's why I'm hosting this podcast, is trying to help other developers out. Um, yeah, what about you, Mark? Yeah, so um, my name's Mark Blanchard, uh, also a grad of Full Stack Academy of Code. Um, I have been a professional software engineer for under two years. Um, and I also um, am an artist. So uh, I've done, I have some uh, public artworks uh, across the city of Chicago. Do you still keep up with it? Uh, well, given that what's been going on this year, it's been hard, but yeah, definitely I do. Nice. Very yeah, nice. Still working on projects. Yeah. All right. Sorry to switch in scenes real quick. Okay. Uh, very cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The cams should be showing. I broke it for a second, but they should be showing prototypal. Thank you. Uh, all right, cool. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Sorry, I was a little distracted, but but thank you. No worries. Yeah. All right, Ben, you're up. Cool. Yeah, my turn. Um, yeah, I'm Ben. I am a former graphic designer slash artist who ended up switching over to software engineering after going to Full Stack Academy around 2017. Um, ever since then, I've uh, sort of done a bit of teaching at Full Stack Academy, starting out doing a lot of their handling a lot of our meetups, such as their introductory courses and their uh, sort of courses leading up to Full Stack itself. And now I'm uh, teaching their part-time curriculum for Chicago. Um, outside of that, I work as a software engineer at Jelly Vision Labs during the day, um, doing software engineering stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, I love it. I'm actually really excited that all of you kept your jobs. Um, because it's, it's been pretty rough for some people out there. Um, I do, I mean, there, there are just some situations where it really has nothing to do with your skill level. It doesn't. Like I had, um, for a lot of people, I, I kind of just want to say this, for a lot of people that are getting let go, um, I, my very first job, we had about 90 people and um, we, we just weren't doing well financially. We let like 20 people go. Uh, tech team didn't get touched, but then eventually half the company got let go. Half of the rest of the company that was still left got let go. Um, all the senior engineers, or most of them, got let go. And I literally was the only UI developer left. And I was still like, that was my first year. And my boss had 15 years and he was a very, very good developer. It's just, um, sometimes it's, it really isn't your fault. So anyone that is struggling, um, hey, feel free to reach out and ask questions if I can help you. But uh, just, just keep pushing forward. That's just what I want to say about that. All right, so just to give everyone a heads up, uh, we really just jump into a bunch of topics. Um, I actually came up with some topics. I think I gave you guys an idea, but I wanted to, it's actually harder than it seems because everyone agrees with each other. And 
So like, I, I was really trying to think of topics where we had a little bit of disagreement um, because I think that's really, really healthy. And I'm a big advocate of um, speaking your mind as a developer. I like candidness and I appreciate positions that uh, appreciate candidness as well because I think that's how developer teams grow. So that's really the mentality of this podcast. Um, but, um, you know, we've had those conversations before. They're always friendly. I've always loved them. We're just doing it live on a podcast right now. So are you guys ready to get started? Okay, cool. Uh, we'll actually jump into our first topic. Um, if you see Aurora pop in and I miss it, from downstairs. let me know and I'll, I'll bring her in. It's on the table. All right. Uh, whew, which do I want to dive into first? Um, let's... Oh, this is going to be good. All right, so coding boot camps have created a huge, obnoxious surplus of developers that are now struggling to get jobs. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, like specifically given COVID or, or more broadly? Let's exclude uh, COVID. Excluding COVID. Obviously yep. COVID hit is to the extent there is a surplus. It's really oh, you know, yeah. crunched that. Um, so this one I did do five minutes of extremely cursory research um from various sources i'll throw out a couple of numbers um so based on the uh, bureau of labor statistics a 2018 study there are 4.5 million uh, cs and it jobs in the us so that is broader than just software engineers that includes um like arch system architecture work um i think some web design aspects of that but but jobs that conceivably someone coming from a boot camp would uh you know, would be qualified for, or you could see that being a career path for them. Um, according to core support, there are about 45,000 projected bootcamp grads in 2019. So I think that was another 2018 study. Um, and in 2017, there were 106,000 uh, computer science grads uh, from, from the collegiate level. Um, of course, keeping in mind that not everyone who becomes a, a programmer has a, a computer science degree, even those who didn't go through the boot camp route. Um, and so the Bureau of Labor Statistics also projects a 12% growth in those 4.5 million jobs over the next 10 years. Um, so I don't know exactly what those numbers tell you because <laughs> I did five minutes of research, like I said, um, but my sense is that there are, it's, you know, the, the pool of jobs is growing more quickly than the um, and then the you know boot camps are, are growing in terms of pure numbers, not necessarily the the rate of growth. Um, but that that could change. Anecdotally, uh, I, I haven't seen that, but I, I've been in the the same position. I haven't looked for a job in in three and a half years, so things could have very well changed in the in the past little while. So, so first of all, good for you for doing research. <laughs> I can tell you most people, most people don't, uh, including me for, for a lot of different topics. Um, and I think that is a good reminder that, um, well, first of all, like a, a big part of this podcast, like you don't need data to back up your opinions. Just say it. If you have an opinion, if you have an experience, just say it. But that, that is interesting that you say that because um, I guess anecdotally, everyone that we've kind of I, I think like all of you have a good um breadth of experience for like everyone that comes in you know who like what their struggles are how many people are struggling because uh, we've had we've had uh i think over a thousand people come into our meetups so far believe it or not which is huge number we've we've helped over a thousand people and that is um that's really that it's just really good to hear that number and see it and uh and just see the impact but it it definitely i think we've heard a lot of the struggles so why I, I guess maybe my question is does anyone does anyone have a different opinion do you anecdotally feel like there are m many more opportunities and that uh, a lot of junior developers and aspiring developers really have a lot of picks like they're not desperate for a job do you have a an opposing opinion um i have, I have a, not necessarily opposing opinion but just 
anecdotal experience that might uh, contradict the statistics a little bit. And um, so just some of my colleagues, colleagues who graduated alongside me um, got past, like pretty much got past like half a year of searching um, at a certain point. And I think, you know, um, cause I, I tried to stay in communication and continue to try to help um, as much as I could. And um, I think that, you know, when we're searching for these jobs, there's more than just the developer aspect of it, like how skilled you are as a developer. But then there's also, I guess, like a bit of social skills, um, leadership skills um, that, that uh, these companies are looking for. Um, in addition to, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Look like you're ready to chime in, Dan. Dan. No, 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 keep oh, going. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i think that you know that there, there were a couple experiences like that where you know people had been practicing um development they had uh, a collection of um projects that they could show um but there was just there was still other th like for, for for different reasons like they were still having a tr uh, trouble landing job so I don't have like the exhaustive list of all that went into that, but I, I definitely think that, that um, you know, a part of the interview process, just being able to show confidence um, is a big part of that. But I think like, especially for people who like, either are teaching themselves or went to a, a boot camp and they're like in the process of a career change, right? Mm -hmm. you, you finish those programs and you, you, you still feel like you're, you're at the beginning. Right. Um, so it's you're like dealing with that while also having to show like, no, I'm really confident. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. Um, so. So here's what I want to say to that. So, you know, that, that that was kind of my experience when I when I talk to people that do even come from Full Stack Academy. And I've, I've said this before. I think it's one of the top coding boot camps. It, it does what it does really well. Um, and when I talk to someone and I, I get to, because I, I do ask this question a lot, like what's happening with the rest of your cohort? Like how are they doing? You know, you just graduated, the rest of your cohort graduated. I like to kind of just pick at that and, and ask questions. I'm just curious. And that's that's what I've gotten as well. A lot of people are struggling. They're hitting that six month mark and they still don't have a position. I'm not saying everyone, but the majority. And it is it is pretty much a struggle. So what you had mentioned, Nick, was... The opportunities are out there. You had mentioned that it was all encompassing with several tech positions, which uh, we would probably need to like dig more specifically into the open developer coding positions, and then that you know that can get into murky waters of like what is coding and what even makes you a developer. But like you know, for for just um, simplistic sake, uh, just just people that are writing code, building out features, that are fixing bugs, that are actually typing out code let's just call it that um, why do you think I bet you like a big chunk of that is probably programmer positions but why do you think there are so many open positions like that because I've seen those stats as well why do you think there are so many open positions like that for developers to get hired yet developers are struggling so much I think there is sometimes uh unrealistic expectations set by the the companies for the like you know explicit qualifications that someone will have i'm sure you, you see online all the time that you know you need like 12 years of kubernetes experience required for this position which is a framework that's only been out for like five years or, or whatever but so I, th I think part of the problem is because it's such a quickly evolving field the technologies are changing all the time um, the requirements are changing all the time um, and a lot of the hiring is not done by engineers themselves, but rather uh, the HR department or some outside recruiting firm that they have a hard, those non-technical people who are in charge of some of that hiring have a hard time keeping up with the changes in the industry. And that can, there's then a, a disconnect between the skill set of the people who are coming out of boot camps or college and what the expectations are for a, a position at least from the, the perspective of a, a non-technical um, hiring 
recruiter. Yeah, um, it, that that's a really good point. So so unrealistic expectations, and I'm going to play the devil's advocate a little bit to a lot of your thoughts, um, but eventually when they don't hire anyone wouldn't those expectations lower eventually yeah um you would think but by by that point maybe they they have a, a different need or they just they call off the search they they you know if it was a more senior position someone junior within the company goes up or they just push it onto the plate of of another team within the uh whatever that work that needed to be done was whatever that original hole in their operations was they just used another team to fill it added more onto their plate i would love to add to this too because i wonder what you all feel about this which is um on the company side of things and this is something i hear while i'm working a lot right just this term velocity right and just speaking towards um how fast are we how fast are we growing? How fast are we developing things, right? Or to abstract it further, I think about companies uh, where the CEOs have like uh, meetings with their shareholders, right? And they talk about like what they've done in the last quarter, how much they're growing, right? So, you know, to connect that back to a developer, right? Like, I think that there's a system that that is maybe, maybe not greedy, but hungry for progress and growth. Right. And then from the perspective of someone who's starting, right, they're just, they're just starting out, they're a junior developer. Um, you know, the expectation within the company is that there's going to be a longer ramp up period when they have these other constraints or pools um, in terms of thinking about their personal growth or the growth that they're being pressured by shareholders or some grander community. Um, and I think that sometimes that can contribute to like that, that, that scenario can make it more competitive, right? You're not competing with another person specifically, right? Yeah. But you're competing with the system. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a really good point. Um, I think it kind of bridged a little bit into what Nick was saying. Um, be, I, so a lot of positions get opened up. Companies are ambitious. They want to build new features, and that is what the budget currently supports. And then eventually, I mean, budgets change, you know, all throughout the year. And eventually, sometimes positions are just shut down, and uh, work is passed on to the other developers to take care of it. Um, often to other senior developers, or just people who have that availability, and it they fill it up. Because um, I, I do see positions open and close. Uh, it's happened at companies I've worked at, and uh, the work just got passed on to the developers on the team. That, that's definitely a thing. Uh, but it, like you were saying, I think I think companies are ambitious, especially like some some are greedy. Some are like greedily ambitious, but some also um, some don't even have the staff to support a lot of junior growth. They don't have the, that time period to ramp someone up. Uh, they don't have the availability of the developers. So are you are you kind of suggesting that maybe a lot of the open positions have higher expectations that junior developers don't meet and that's where the stats are kind of getting bloated with do you do you feel like companies don't really have the budget or the availability sometimes to bring on junior developers yeah that's kind of the direction i was going in um but now having said that nick in the research that you do and those put those open positions were those specifically geared towards junior developers oh those were not those are just the the total job pool they weren't open positions um, oh, okay but that's a that's a really good point um i mean i i think it, at least kind of in in my experience in my company you can't really expect really any engineer but but particularly junior engineers to like reach you know productivity until like three to six months after you hire them and that is especially that's taking on a lot of risk as a company, right? Like, especially looking at the bottom line, like that's three to six months of, of a, a developer's salary before they even, you know, start contributing to the company. And in that time, while they are ramping up, they are taking away you know, time from, from other people, which is what you were, what you were just getting at. 
Yeah, that's that that's a really good point. So so do you feel like so what we've kind of like circled around a problem. I think we've kind of come to the conclusion that there are positions um, that are more open to mid-level developers and up. And I, I've even found that, I don't know if you guys have found that, but my second position, my third position was much easier to get. It wasn't even a struggle at all. I didn't have to put the number of applications. I think even before Catalytic, I put in like seven or something like that with companies I really, really wanted to work at. And I had some interviews pretty quickly. Um, but it, that's kind of what I'm seeing too, is like a lot of companies want mid-level developers and up. They don't really have the budget or the time or the resources to be able to support that ramp up period. So what, like what, what's the solution? Sometimes the solu- maybe the solution isn't to be given to like junior developers, but I, I feel like there are two paths right now. It's literally push the companies to be more realistic and open up their resources and budget for junior developers or push educational programs, including coding boot camps, to be at a higher tier to prepare them better. Maybe that, like I was just thinking about Full Stack Academy, it would be great to have a big complex application for, um, and I don't think you could do it within the current time, but like second or like after that second phase, like have them dive into a complex code base, get comfortable with the norms of that code base and adapt to it. Like that's a big part of the ramp up period is like all of a sudden now you're introduced to this enormous uh, code base that is, you know, 50 times the size of any of your personal projects. And so, so that, that's the second choice. Do we, do we basically like push for companies to be more realistic, however we wanted to find that, or do we push educational programs to, to do the ramp up period themselves? I think that one thing that would really help out with that is if there was a more solid definition of what a junior developer is or what it means to be a junior developer. Because one question that I find that I get asked a lot at our meetups and stuff like that is sort of what job should I be looking for? Which application should I consider and which which job should I be submitting myself to? Because a lot of times there tends to be more creative liberties taken with developer job postings than I'd imagine a lot of other job postings in terms of, hey, this job is specifically looking for React developers, but if you have knowledge of a similar front end framework, you could reasonably be onboarded into this or be um, expected to understand this. Um, So I think that having a, a solid pathway into figuring out, hey, am I ready to apply for this front-end role? Or, hey, am I ready to call myself a junior developer and sort of take on these monikers? Um, Might help both educate people who are trying to apply in terms of what should I be preparing for and how should I be prepared for that and sort of educate companies and what they want to look for. Um, So so you're saying more of like a solid, like, so that's the big question. That's why people will go towards structured learning is because how do I know I've learned enough? What do I need to know? Yeah. And you're saying that really hasn't been solidified and that maybe the solution is to solidify that path for people so that companies can more clearly lay down those expectations. Yeah, exactly. And like, it admittedly, it's, yeah, admittedly, it's a very hard thing to figure out within the programming industry because you just have so many technologies and so many different paths you can take to get to that baseline of what you need to get a job. But um, I feel like if there were just something where like, yeah, yeah, I passed this point, now I'm ready to sort of tackle these new roles. I'm sort of ready to tackle these new opportunities. Um, It would both simplify that process in terms of cutting down on, you know, developers who might not be prepared for the role as much as they should be. And both people who are applying for, or who are skipping over jobs that they probably should be applying for and could reasonably get. Yeah, that, that that's a very big ask of anyone um, to solidify those requirements with where we are in the tech industry. But I think like everyone would agree with you. Those expectations are not clearly defined. We, Nick, you had, you had mentioned you have expectations on a resume that don't even make sense. The technology hasn't even been out that long. And like that's where we are is I don't feel like a lot of job postings like 
they really, I, I don't feel like a lot of companies know how to write good job postings. And I've found, it was interesting. I, I actually want to bring this up to you guys. I'm genuinely curious of your thoughts. I've, my second company, Albert, um, they had a job posting where it mentioned JavaScript, no JavaScript, but it like, it pretty much as far as technical capabilities left it at that, right? There were a lot of soft skills they looked for leadership qualities and it was like they almost minimized what you needed to know with tech but they highlighted all of these soft skills and i found that they were more adaptable to your previous experience and they really they just wanted a good javascript developer that's it they didn't care like they worked with react nonstop, but they wanted a good javascript developer and that's really what they look for i don't know do you feel like do you feel like these job postings need to like trim the technical requirements and be more adaptable? Or do you feel like they're going to get a surplus of candidates that are unqualified for that they're now going to have to filter out? Yeah, I think it's it's generally a step in the right direction because it's a general acknowledgement of, hey, we're not bringing on JavaScript developers so much as we are bringing up learners. We're bringing up people who can come into this position, make a reasonable um, contribution to our code base and just learn whatever technologies we need them to because at the end of the day no developer it's going to be very rare that you find a developer who's familiar with your entire stack they're going to have to learn some part of it and even after they've learned some part of it it's eventually going to change in you know sometimes slight or sometimes major ways in which you're going to need some new form of onboarding um so i think trimming that down is both going to it, it's both an acknowledgement of hey there's more to being a developer than just writing code and it's also a way of encouraging people to, like you said, take advantage of their former experience. They acknowledge that, hey, I do have worth in this industry that's more than the time I've spent with code. There are soft skills that I've built up over time that are very valuable to what I'm going to be doing in my future. Yeah, Ben, I really like that point about companies should be looking for for learners rather than people with a you know precise set of experience because as you mentioned, like tech stack is constantly changing the the industry is constantly moving in a different direction inevitably you're going to have to be able to to learn something new um, as it changes so if you get someone who's great at one thing but you know can't can't adapt to something new then that's like not valuable for the company yeah yeah for sure um one of the best pieces of advice i got when going through my job search um, was i was talking to one of the uh, former lead developers at Jellyvision, he was telling me at the that at the end of the day, companies don't want to bring in that perfect developer that can do every single thing that they want them to do when they're looking for a junior developer. They want to bring in that junior developer who they can sort of mold into the senior developer they eventually want working at their company. Um, because there's sort of this expectation of growth when you're bringing on a junior role. So, so th those that that's such a good point, and I agree with you. I like I was trying to find some way to challenge that, and I just I completely agree with you <laughs> on it. I really do. Um, I really think I really think that's the key. Yeah, it almost makes me wonder. I would love to see just like pick out twenty job applications and, and just find out the position of the person that actually wrote that application like what i want to do is dig yeah. into who's writing certain types of or not job applications but uh job postings i think that'd be really interesting to see but i, I do think that it, that is the solution i think it is getting companies to be a little bit more open and it really comes with like hiring ctos that are going to have that mentality too it's like putting the leaders of the tech teams on the spot with that kind of um that kind of hiring philosophy i think that's a really really good take on it so so that you know that that's a bigger push and especially as an outsider to the company if you're not an employee inside the company i like i would highly encourage developers like to take that piece that you you both just said and um like i can promise you even as a junior developer your cto or your manager is listening um uh, and and like really talk about um even just like who you would want to work with as a developer. And I, usually that topic kind of get comes up and the manager will will uh, eventually like 
I think a good manager is always going to keep communication open. Um, and you can kind of talk about that a little bit. Um, even start with like, you know, what, what do you see as a good developer? And like that can really, uh, first of all, like figure out the expectations of your manager, but it can also start the conversation of like even just mentioning the idea, this is who I, you know, at my last position, this type of developer is who I love to work with. Like we got along so well, pushed out features, there was so much synergy. And I really like, I think it happens with the developers currently at a company and their manager because it's really hard to like push this sort of philosophy to a bunch of like random companies um you know even if i was like much much larger and i i was pushing out like this types of content it, it helps coming from the people within i but i, I really love that idea so idealistically that's what we would want but we don't have that right now and so we we have other ways that we can kind of challenge developers to, to push themselves a little bit harder and become more marketable and become the types of developers that are learners and that are growers and that are going to be able to adapt um, but I, I want to hear from you so like I said we had a thousand people come to our meetup why are people why are aspiring developers not getting jobs what are some of the main reasons that you've seen Just put y'all on I'll the start. Spot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start. So I already mentioned uh, confidence. And I think that, you know, some of the people who did come uh, to our meetup were very um, adept at developing, you know, at a, at a junior level, but they showed a lot of promise and they were very skillful. Um, uh, but I already talked about confidence. I think another thing is, um, commitment before you go to commitment to, what yeah what does confidence look like in a developer um, confidence um the way that i think about it most right at this moment is just like even just having the confidence to apply um because yeah. there were there were some developers who came and they had contributed to a lot of open source projects. Um, they were able to like hold conversa fluent conversations, right, of like algorithms and the way that they were approaching the frameworks within their individual projects that they were working on, right? Um, but even after show showcasing all of that, you know, they would express like, oh, I still don't quite feel ready um, because I'm looking at these applications that are junior roles, but then they say, I'm looking for five plus years experience, right? Um, and so that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from there. Okay. All right, cool. I was just curious. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, um, you were going into commitment, sorry. Oh, commitment. Yeah. So, uh, and you all were kind of talking about this with developers being learners. Right, but I think about um, the ways that we can dig deep into concepts or new technologies, right? And so, as you all were expressing, like being learners, I think it lends itself to being broad, right? So, like exposing yourself to a little bit of this technology, a little bit of that technology, to to substance, to a substantial degree, right? But trying to stretch out. Um, but I think that in some cases with some of the uh, folks who are able to visit our meetup, um, I think that they would jump into a technology um, very quickly, you know, within the first couple steps, run into a roadblock. And, uh, and even for me now, sometimes, you know, it is easy to get discouraged. Uh, so just remembering like, or practicing to have a little bit more perseverance, right? And having kind of like, okay, I've started this, so I'm at least gonna finish it and then judge the experience and then pivot, you know? Um, because if you if you pivot too early, you might not be able to reflect enough about how to make that, that second try a better experience. I, I wanna add to that, I think that is a really good observation is is the perseverance before you pivot i think people pivot too quickly they get discouraged too quickly but i would actually like take it a step back 
just focus on projects in general. Think about like people that are trying to build out a project that get overwhelmed. They get stuck and they get frustrated and they feel like, oh, not ready enough for this project. And then they go back into learning, which is fine. If, you, if you're just getting stuck too often, you need to go back into the fundamentals. I think that's natural to, to have to do that while you're learning. But then they don't return to the project. Then they start a new project. And it, I almost feel like some of it is that people giving up and not having the confidence. But I also feel like some of it is people trying to ride motivation. They had like all this motivation to create this really cool app. They thought it was going to be a, a great portfolio project. And then they got stuck. Or even they just lost motivation. And then they stopped and they never came back to it. And I see a lot of aspiring developers that have a graveyard of portfolio projects that have never been completed. And they have nothing to show, right? Like a half done project to show to an employer. It's like, that's telling. It's like, are you going to give up in the middle of building a feature? Or like, are you getting stuck? Do you not know how to communicate and ask questions that get help? Do you not know how to, are you not resourceful? I could see like a lot of those questions just being asked because you don't know the person, right? It could have been something completely different. But a half done project is very telling of a developer that's potentially going to deliver a half-baked feature. And so, I, I mean, I think that perseverance is healthy, even if like, you don't enjoy the project anymore. When you just quit in the middle of a project, you have no idea, like you have no room to like reflect. You have nothing to reflect on. And like you said, at least if you finish it, first of all, that's a good habit. Just finishing what you start is a phenomenal habit. And I had a really bad habit of not doing that for a very long time. I'm very guilty of this, but um, that's a muscle that you should be building throughout life in general. But yeah, they like a lot of aspiring developers, I feel like that they're like not gaining the confidence they really could gain because they don't finish anything. And they keep they keep bouncing from tutorial to tutorial and they're not they're not committing to like doing whatever it takes to actually finish. Even if it's like the crappiest project in the world, like it's spaghetti code, tons of bugs. But if it works, you know, you, you can go back and refactor it if you want, but maybe that's where the lack of confidence is coming from is is, is people just like giving up on tutorials, giving up on projects and not giving them, like persevering so they have the time to reflect on their entire journey of that project. Yeah, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna defend my fellow like young developers because it's, it's not 100% to our fault that we don't finish. Um, there's a psychological term that I learned about uh, and I, I have no degrees in psychology. Um, but it's called overchoice, right? And it's it's when you're inundated with so many options that it it disables you from being able to choose anything, right? And so, mm -hmm. the deeper that you break into these technologies, right? The deeper you get into your project, you're like, oh, I can do this, I can do that, oh, I can pick that thing over there, you know? Oh wait, there's testing. <laughs> and it, suddenly, you know. Um, you might not always be as excited as I am. You might just be like, oh man, this is, this is so much. I just need to take a break, mm. you know? And then I think probably what can happen after that is you begin to associate that particular project with that experience, which is a very frightening experience. Um, and maybe mm. it's just easier to start a new one. But I think, you know, when I was speaking to Roblox, I wasn't speaking about learning how to code necessarily right or exclusively um you know like that that over choice is one of the roadblocks that that we all have to face um and yeah just knowing how to make something infinite knowing how to break it up into a a consumable step yeah yeah yeah, that's something that really heavily resonates with me as someone who's experienced that a lot where, you know, you're just sitting there and you're like, I could learn Python right now, or I could learn Java, or I could learn JavaScript, and any of these can reasonably get me to where I'm trying to go, but they, I found that when you're faced with option paralysis like that, you sort of just have to learn to pick one and run with it. You have to get comfortable with the idea that when you're creating a program, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to pick technologies if it don't work out, and sometimes you're going to have to sort of pivot and restructure your approach. Um, so I, I very much agree that that's like a huge part of being a developer, just figuring out how to manage all the different options that are there. 
Um, but it's also sort of like this point of growth for them in a sense. Um, I think it's re really challenging and takes a lot of experience to learn how to properly manage that that kind of over choice that you, you constantly have because there are you know a million frameworks to solve any kind of problem, particularly in a, like the JavaScript ecosystem, which I, I know we're all familiar with. Um, I think something that that helps that takes practice to get good at is, is you know really breaking down the steps that you need to take to get to the ultimate destination to that completed project. Um, like really, you know, super discrete pieces of work, trying to time box them. I know that's a strategy I try to do at work when I'm handed like a, a larger project with, um, especially something that I'd be doing solo or with a, a really small team. Being organized helps, you know, re reduce that over choice. So I have these, you know, five things that I, I need to do, right? And I just pick one of those things to do and go with it. Um, so ha having that, that plan makes it harder to hit those dead ends. Yeah, I think that's a huge advantage of the sort of ticketing architecture a lot of companies take when planning out their projects, because not only does that give your developers something to work on, it sort of gives them a definition of done. It gives you a way of saying, hey, today I completed this part of my application. Today I achieved this. Um, and sort of taking that and applying it to your personal projects, whether that be actually creating some sort of board for yourself when you're planning out your projects and creating issues for you to work through, or just sort of defining your minimum viable product for what you're trying to create. Um, I think that's a huge step in the right direction because it gives junior developers sort of milestones that they can reach when working on something without yeah, that's having a, to achieve that dream. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, a great point. Like just getting that feeling of having accomplished something um, because it, Rome wasn't built in a day, right? You're not gonna finish your, your project in like one shot. It's not. There are, there are, you know, multiple milestones on the on the path to completion. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really like the idea that you guys mentioned of maybe you're not going to know that path. Like you're going to be given a very complex task. And whether that task is a really, really huge project, a feature that works given you, or it's becoming a developer, right? It's really hard to know that path specifically, but I think... I think you start to learn how to solidify that path on your own by just taking one step at a time, re-examining, like, did you, are you any further? Sometimes, like, if you're trying to become a developer, sometimes it just means, okay, has anyone just added a new project to my portfolio? I hooked up a database to it. Do employers care about this portfolio now, right? And it's just putting out more applications and getting that feedback back. Like, you can, you can use several milestone markers or whatever to identify that you're actually accomplishing accomplishing something but you're not going to have any like feedback you're not going to have any data to figure out if you're on the right path until you just like start doing something and that, that's part of uh, you know that's kind of one of my frustrations is like when someone's like give me step by step by step by step and they haven't even like they haven't looked up anything they're just like I want to become a developer um what, like what do I do and then like what you I, I think all of you have this experience like you kind of have to explore well, what have they done so far what do they enjoy why are they getting into coding um what like what did they like about what they have done let's let's push forward with that and I think the idea is you just got to keep pushing forward and I think that's the mentality we've instilled in a lot of people is just like you can ask these questions but they're not going to provide you as much value as you think they're going to provide you because you're still on step one two or three when they're like 20 other steps you know what i mean so i like the idea of just taking one step at a time and trusting the process that it's going to solidify that path for you because eventually you're gonna you're gonna figure it out and i i think it is a challenge to like identify where you're screwing up and where you need to pivot um that's why i think a lot of people appreciate structured learning because people can tell them like if they're going off track but I, like you even think about like tutorials, right? They, a lot of tutorials and courses promise like, if you get to the end, you're gonna be hireable. Do you, do you trust tutorials like that? Do you trust, uh, I'm, I'm gonna like pick on online tutorials. Um, I'm not gonna mention coding boot camps, although coding boot, a lot of coding boot camps would be a good example, but 
do you feel like a lot of tutorials that are saying like we're a start to finish tutorial and you will be able to get a job by the end of this tutorial do you do you trust tutorials like that do you feel like they do provide a lot of value towards people I feel like I trust boot camps a lot more with that, not because of their content, but because you have a person you can reach out to who can tell you, hey, I've seen what you've learned, I've seen what you've done. You seem like you're ready to achieve this next position. While with tutorials, it's very easy. Everyone sort of has a different, different definition of what it means to go through a tutorial. Some people will stop and study every single thing they go through along the way and sort of add on extra content, which you may need depending on what you're doing. While others, you know, might just flip through it, go through all the videos, get to the end and be like, okay, I got this cert. Um, so that's, I would say, one thing that would make me very cautious of courses like that is that, again, what it means to be a developer, the thresholds you sort of have to cross before you can reasonably make contributions towards being a developer might, let me rephrase that, the takeaways you might get from that course that would make you a developer and push you over these thresholds that would turn you into what a developer could be might be different, very different from the takeaways that the person who was creating those tutorials had expected you to take away or might be very different from someone who has, you know, a different level of experience might have taken away from those tutorials. Because um, I know there, like for me, one of the things I went through before going to full stack was elegant JavaScript. I tried working my way through that. I tried seeing what takeaways I could. And I know for a fact that after I had gone through a good portion of the full stack curriculum and had gone back and reread some of those sections of Eloquent JavaScript, I ended up taking away a lot more just because I had much better foundations in what was going on within that book. Um, so in other words, I think it's, I think it's very hard to say that, you know, there, there's just one pill that you can take to create that developer mindset because what you take out of that might be incredibly different from what the expected person would take out of that sense. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I think a lot of instructors and course creators have a good intentions and they pour their heart into it. But um, yeah, sometimes it doesn't resonate with junior developers. Like we I recommend Eloquent JavaScript. A lot of us recommend Eloquent JavaScript to the people that come into the meetup. But I, I remember reading that before Full Stack Academy, and it was hard. I didn't retain much. It, um, it was just a, a lot of concepts all at once, and I felt like it jumped around a lot. And it's still a really good book for junior developers. But sometimes it is the understanding that like if you do go through a course, and this is kind of what I'm reading from this, if you do go through a course, it's providing value to you, but you don't need to fully understand it for it to provide value to you. Like a lot of good books and a lot of good courses, if you enter them again after you get some experience, it's going to solidify knowledge. It's going to increase that value that it provides, but sometimes the first time around, you're just not in the mindset to absorb that information and retain it in the way that's going to make you a much better developer. I think that's a really good yeah. point. Yeah, and I think it's very much an extension of the idea that at the end of the day, development's a skill. Mm -hmm. The only way to truly get better at it is to just keep doing it over and over again. So, you know, if you go through the same book twice, you're going to be practicing the same skills twice and you're just going to be reinforcing those things that you already know. Yes. Yeah, I completely agree with that. All right. I think I think we touched on a lot of like really good topics for junior developers. Um, I love kind of starting out with that focus. Uh, because I, I just like, I think my one main takeaway, my one main takeaway is still the same. It's, I feel bad for junior developers. It's, uh, it's, it's very hard to know what to do. And, um, even if like you try to solidify some sort of, uh, standard for expectations and how to list them on job postings, like every company is going to be so different. Every application is going to be so different. It's very hard to solidify that, like a template that's going to work for every company. I, that's probably why it hasn't been figured out yet, you know? Um, but I want to jump into, okay, on the job stuff. I, I'm really curious what you guys think about some of this. So as developers with your current experience, uh, we'll actually jump into this in the next one. Um, so there is a saying 
that extensive use of third-party libraries and frameworks is a sign of incompetence of understanding the fundamentals or a language in depth. What do you guys think about that? Only sometimes, not usually. I think if it's important to know exactly why you are pulling in a, a library and are able to kind of justify to yourself that it's the right decision. I think if you are blindly pulling in libraries to compensate for not knowing how something works or not understanding a particular concept, then that is not necessarily a, a sign of incompetence, but a, a an opportunity where you could be bettering yourself as a developer and you're kind of doing yourself a disservice by pulling in that third party library. There are, I'm sorry, two, I have a little bit of not invented here syndrome. Um, I, I really try to minimize the, the third party libraries I use because I think like I, I should like, you know, learn how to do that rather than relying on someone else's work and that way you have more control. But there are a million uh, examples of places where it's not feasible to yourself write a uh, you know code that you you they would be a lot easier to pull in from a library like for instance for a, a side project that i was doing um i wanted to write an algorithm to like programmatically break words up into their their syllables so like properly split them in the right parts and i'm like okay this is i'm, I'm gonna be able to do this like there's uh, there must be research out there like i can i can look at it and like code something up and um half an hour later on page like five of an 80 page thesis i was like no time for a library um, and that that is one of those instances where i'm like completely comfortable pulling in a library when it's a, a targeted problem and you can justify that it is absolutely not worth my time and energy to solve this already solved problem myself like let's just pull in a maintained respected library that will take care of this specific problem for me uh, so yeah only sometimes is it a sign of uh is it a bad thing to use third-party libraries okay nick says only sometimes what uh, what about you guys i definitely agree i think that Another major growth point for me as a developer was recognizing that you need to sort of understand why you're bringing in a library before you bring it in, because dependencies can shoot you in the foot sometimes. Um, I know that on some of my old personal projects, NPM is personally very mad at me and you know tells me to constantly run NPM fix because of old dependencies that I've had. And I know that there have been times on the job where you know, some random dependency of a dependency of a dependency was updated or something along those lines and then it caused a break in my code um, so i think that as long as you're bringing in your libraries with intention that's fine because at the end of the day you're not you don't want to reinvent the wheel every time you want to do something because that's just going to be you know shooting yourself in the foot when you're trying to be productive but if you're just bringing on every single library that you can without any thought to like, hey, is this a respected library? Is this something that other people have used or something that is notorious enough that I'm not going to risk much by taking it in? Um, I think I think it's very much a mindset there, you know? OK, so your focus is on averting risk. Yes. OK. Yeah. Yeah, that's sorry, Mark, were you going to say something? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Don. Oh, I was just saying kind of, um, yeah, I mean, that's a good point. That's a frustrating point is when you have broken dependencies. And um, I mean, even just, I mean, you should always be controlling. I don't think any company just has, just like randomly updates their application and all of the dependencies without yeah. testing. Um, but I, I, there, there actually are a lot of companies that do. Um, I've never worked for one, but there are. There are definitely a lot of startups where they just do just a full update of everything. Um, and they, they don't test it properly. So I think, yeah, yeah, like dependencies of dependencies. And when you get further into that, it, it's hard to, to really keep track of that. 
without it breaking your application, especially when you have to connect to like third party APIs and depend that, um, you know, that their structure um, or whatever they're sending you sending back is actually consistent with what they set. And there have been third party APIs that I've, I've worked with, with companies that they just break our application because they weren't consistent with what they promised in their documentation. And that's a thing. And you, that's why you have to be careful about what third party APIs you use. Um, but yeah, I, I like, I really like the idea. I really like the idea of learning. Uh, because, yeah, 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 I'm just gonna say that. I really like the idea of learning how to do something rather than depending on a library. Um, and it, my kind of mindset is once I've kind of learned how to do this, um, then I kind of lean towards a library to solve it for the second time or the third time or the fourth time, especially if it was at a previous company. But yeah, sometimes you just don't, you don't have time. Like that we, we all have demands of an application and sometimes it, something is so low level and it, it's like irrelevant to the actual value that the feature is going to provide. Um, you just, you bring in a library to solve that when it's already been solved. Um, it's risky. You know, any, any library that you bring is, is risky, uh, but I feel like, yeah, I feel like a lot of people are just going to say, well, it depends on the situation, but I was curious about it because some people are so opinionated on, on, I think like you get more opinionated people on don't use these third party libraries. And it's usually outside the JavaScript stack. It's usually people that, uh, cause JavaScript is ever changing. There's so many abstractions on abstractions. I think that that's like one of the most frustrating things about JavaScript is not only like how much work and time it takes to to even maintain a code base with all of these uh, libraries, but um, even just to learn it and keep up with it as a JavaScript developer. It's I feel like it is one of the harder developer positions out there because of how much you have to keep up with. Do you think we're insane for yeah. choosing the language or? <laughs> well, it's hard. It's harder to be language agnostic, right? Yeah, for some people. For some people, yeah. I wanted to add to like one of the things that, uh, like, just due diligence on my part is I, I asked this question: uh, if how how long will this library be supported? You know, or how well is it supported now, right? And the more libraries you incorporate into your project, the higher the risk that one of them is no longer going to be supported, right? Mm -hmm. So as as time passes and you want to integrate newer technologies into your application, right? That that's going to be a like serious obstacle. Yeah. Um, and then it some yeah. and depending on how long you develop on these projects and you wait to upgrade, it almost becomes impossible, right? Just tangibly impossible uh, just because of uh, how long it would take, right? To like gut out the old library and to put in a new library because your, your code, you know, it's, it's hard, it's hard to separate concerns when you're using libraries. Yeah. Your app, so. yeah. 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 I think that's a really good point because as you add in new libraries, not only are you I mean, you're, you're bringing in this functionality, but you're also adding a level of abstraction to your app. You're putting in this function or you're adding in these features that newer developers who are maybe just junior developers who are coming in, who may have not had time to work with that library before are gonna have to learn and also one day might have to rewrite or might have to pivot around. Yeah, I, yeah you brought up two good points, pulling the um, pulling the library out when you have to, when it's no longer maintained and it becomes buggy or it doesn't integrate well with a newer version of React that you're upgrading to. As I've had an instance where that took us a whole week because it was so well ingrained in, I think like before I got there at Albert, like they tossed Redux. Redux was so well ingrained in that. And um, it's it can take a long time. It's a lot of technical debt to pull out a library. That's That's what you have to think about before you introduce it. That's a really good point. Um, this is something that like really emphasizes in my mind. Go ahead, Nick. I'm curious, what, what are your, your opinions on like utility libraries, like underscore or, or Lodash? 
I want to hear from you guys. Well, for, for me, I, despite my not invented here syndrome, I pretty frequently use Lodash, especially if I'm, I'm trying to skip something up quickly, like just having those that set of utility functions that I'm familiar with. Um, they have them implemented more efficiently than I would um, if I were to write it myself. It would take me a few minutes to like, you know, think through whatever problem I was trying to solve or whatever I was trying to re-implement. Um, I use it as a, as, a, as a time saver and because it's a, a well-known, well-supported, well-documented library, like it seems yeah. like a, a, for me, that's a little bit of a no-brainer. Um, though I do yeah. have like a slight twinge of guilt every time because I'm like, I could, I, you know, I could do this. It's not complicated. It's just, yeah, less efficient. I think, yeah, I think, go ahead, Ben. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I think the keyword you hit on there was libraries that you're familiar with. There's things that you've used before and that you sort of have this understanding of. Um, so I think it's very okay to sort of depend on those just because you know what they're doing. When you're importing that into your library, you know what you're going to get because you've seen it before in other instances and you know that like a lot of people use Lodash. Um, so I'm personally in support of it. Were you going to say something, Tom? Yeah, maybe I'm the odd man out here. I'm not a fan of Lodash. And here's why. Because it, it's convenient. Just like any other library is, it's very convenient. But I feel like Lodash has kind of grown. It has a lot of good utility functions. But it also, I don't want to like give it its own syntax, but it also has its own style of writing things. That I think, um, I've seen a lot of developers like mix just using Lodash and then manipulating data in a different way alongside each other. And it feels weird to read. And I get like there are certain, certain things that you're going to prioritize Lodash and certain things you feel like you don't need it. But I, I don't like being taught, I don't like like switching my mindset over and over and over for all of these different libraries that kind of require this, this stylistic way to write code and this um, just these patterns of code it it doesn't make me go faster um, I, I don't know I like I really am on the fence with Lodash I've used it at every single company I'm just not a fan most of what it does I'm like we can write really simple utility functions for this that look a little bit more like what we're doing with the rest of our code um, I've never been a fan of Lodash because of that I think though, you know, and this isn't this isn't like a, a big problem, really, but anytime, you know, you implement your own library rather than utilizing one, um, you also have to think about documentation. Right. So I, I think that, you know, for teams that do utilize Lodash rather than build their own, right, they, they're saving the time because so, someone who's new, who's onboarding, they already have this slew of documentation that they can use to familiarize themselves quickly with it. Um, and I think, you know, even though it does start to use like a coding style that might differ with the rest of your project, um, given that it saves time, I think that it, it does also offer legibility um, because to defensively program otherwise takes a lot of code. Um, so I think that, you know, using Lodash as an example, but, you know, also utility libraries that can improve legibility of code, I think is really big because a lot of times as a developer, you're looking at code that's already written, you're looking to add something to it, you're looking to refactor it, right? Yeah. Okay. I, I think I think most people would agree with, with all of you. I think Lodash is in a lot of code bases for a good reason. Um, but there is, I remember Catalytic, I can't remember what library it was. <sighs> Shoot, I feel like it's at the, at the tip of my tongue, but it was a library where everyone, they just knew it. They had all this native knowledge to it. And I remember a lot of instruction with like one of my first meetings being around just utilizing this, this library to solve this problem. And I think I think it's important because the library that was meant to solve the problem that they wanted me to solve wasn't even mentioned to me. And so I remember like, I'm lucky I asked the right questions for that library to even get mentioned. But I feel like there are a lot of libraries that 
you know, developers that have been at a company for a while, they just know, they just used, like, it, it's just a normal thing, right? They don't even think about it. So a lot of junior developers come in and they solve these problems that have already kind of been solved with a different library or, um, or mid-level developers and senior developers will kind of just say, yeah, just use this library to, to solve this problem. And then like you realize it's gonna take a couple days to even like get through this documentation to understand the library itself. Um, I feel like it would be nice to like have a directory and just some sort of guidance on the libraries that you should be using for certain solutions in your app. I don't know. I don't know if I've solidified that thought very well, but I remember that was a struggle coming into Catalytic at one point. Um, I, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Was the library I... rec? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, you're fine. What's the? Don't. Was remember. the library recompose? Recompose was another one. It wasn't recompose. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, that was the first time I think I've used recompose at Catalytic, and that yeah because yeah that brought yeah that brought a um, a bit more complexity into React that I actually wasn't used to. Um, it wasn't recompose, though. So, no, yeah, but I, I do. I'm, I'm not a fan of recompose. <laughs> I'm not either. I do actually. not love it. No, I'm not either. Why aren't you? Um couple of reasons i think well, well first of all now i think it's like supposed to be obsolete because of react hooks um but but even before then i think it made the code less readable um less maintainable uh it totally fucked up the intellisense in my editor um which <laughs> is probably the the main source of my hate um but I, I felt like it, it, it slowed me down. Um, it made it a lot harder to, when you're looking at a, a new module or component for the first time, understand like what was going on because it pulled in all these other higher order components in a way that wasn't particularly clear. Uh, that was my two cents though. I, I didn't have a, a ton of experience with it. I'm sure I was, uh, I'm sure with more time, it would have been, it would have been better, but in my, my limited experience, I'm not a fan. I think um, this is just a future thought. I think I want to do a podcast about React. Like literally nothing, like just a whole talk, an hour and a half conversation is about React. I think that'd be fun because I have a lot of things to say, especially about libraries that are paired with React. Um, and there are so many different opinions about it, how to even structure the app. I just, I think that'd be a really fun conversation. Um, but that's a side thought. I'm just getting distracted. Uh, so, okay, I think we've kind of, Oh, go ahead. Oh, um, yeah. I was, uh, wrapping back around to um, you know dependencies and stuff like that. Um, I feel like I, I really sympathize with what you're talking about, Dom, because I feel like when you're writing code, you're basically playing this really intense abstract game of exquisite corpse, where your end result is just this amalgamation of everyone into company styles, along with the styles of the libraries you bring in. So by bringing in a new library, you're sort of introducing this extra opportunity for knowledge siloing, where someone might be less motivated to work on parts of your app, or it, there might be like a higher cost to trying to introduce someone to a new party app just because you've introduced all these new libraries. And now they need to learn these libraries in order to make efficient progress with the application not because they're going to be using those libraries in the future they implement, but because they need to know those libraries in order to understand what's happening in the code. So like, if I don't know what certain features of Lodash do, I'm probably going to be, it's probably going to take me a lot longer to decipher what exactly the code is doing just because I don't know what's going on. Um, that's something that can sort of be combated with documentation, like you guys have said, but um, yeah, it's, it's a very, difficult level of abstraction that you're sort of introducing into your application. Yeah. Shoot, I had a good point to add to that. Um, oh, so to add to that, I think, so there there have been a couple times that this has happened where developers have brought into the code base a brand new library. And so we don't find out until the feature is delivered. And usually, like, sometimes we don't even find out until the code reviews, and we're like, why why did you have to use this? And that's usually the question. And so usually most developers will give a good explanation, and by the end it kind of makes sense why they brought it in. But it doesn't mean it was the best 
solution. It doesn't mean it should have been brought in. It's like I think I think people are just getting good at explaining why it makes sense to bring something like that. And so then I think some developers on the team just kind of introduce this extra complexity to the code base. And we don't really think about that is like even though it, it, it makes our solution easier to implement and it makes it easier for a feature, now you just introduce this complexity without talking to the rest of the developer team because they're probably eventually going to have to maintain that part of the app. Like I think a lot of developers have this idea, okay, I'm given this part of the code base, you know, it's my code, I'm just going to introduce this. And it really extends past that. It, like you're never going to, you're probably not going to be at the company forever. If you are, good for you. You found your, your dream job. But it does, like I don't, I really just don't like this introduction of complexity for complexity's sake. Um, even if it just solves a specific feature, I don't feel like developers think ahead and like years down the road and some developers, like you said, don't even do research into like how long it's going to be maintained. But I, I, I guess I am. I, I cringe and I have this, I have this, uh, not perseverance, but this, um, I can't even think of the word, but I, I really have something against this bringing new libraries in and adding complexity. I feel like you need to have an excellent, like a really, really, really good reason that you absolutely need to, or that you absolutely need to make our code base more complex. Because that's what you're doing. It's not your part of the code base, it's everyone now that has to deal with it. Learn a new library. People do this with testing frameworks as well. I think that got introduced with one of my previous companies, but I, I, I just have so much aversion to it. Uh, was that the word I was thinking about? I don't know. But I, yeah, you can tell I'm obviously against complexity for the most part. Don, I have a question for you. Sure. So, you know, what, what would be on your checklist um, for, okay, this is, this is a pretty good reason to uh, think about introducing a new library? Yeah, and it's really, it's really hard to say because every feature is going to be different. And it, there are so many different reasons why you add something to a code base. I feel like I feel like you have to weigh how long it's going to take to recreate that functionality that you're going to introduce. Um, you have to um, kind of even just like I actually want to get away from from bringing in a library for a sec, but even introducing no, I don't think hooks are a big deal. But I feel like when I went to Catalytic, a lot of our components were class-based components and also functional components. We had tons of class-based components. But then hooks started to really get heavily introduced, probably a little bit before I was there. And I didn't know what hooks were. And But, but the assumption was, when I was past that project, that I was able to read everything and understood hooks. And um, and I wasn't. It's, it's something new that I had to learn, and it added it added time to like me actually getting that feature out to just even follow the code base of like how the feature was implemented in a very old way. It was, it was hard for me to read. Um, so it's hard for me to define requirements for a specific library, but I think it's like to define like how I would add requirements for complexity. It's like, that's, that's why it makes it really hard for me to answer that question. How do you how do you bring more complexity into a code base? How do you bring like brand new functions that were just introduced to a framework in a code base? Because it doesn't have to just be a frame, uh, framework or a library. Um, I feel like, and this this was done at a previous company. I feel like if you take the time and make a commitment to educate the rest of the dev team about a library that you're bringing in. And it, you take the time to educate, even if it's like hooks, like it's a newer feature that not everyone knows yet. If you take the time to just like do a little bit of a speech, you're going, you're, you're really holding yourself accountable to introducing this complexity and making sure the rest of the developers understand this. For junior developers, I'm not worried about them because they're eventually just going to have to pick up everything that you guys have adapted. I think that's a natural role for junior developers. And you need to provide that documentation and help them. But for the rest of the developers that are already like overworked, when you bring this complexity, you have to take it upon yourself to understand like, okay, this is actually bringing complexity that's going to slow others down. I need to either do like a mini presentation and teach this, and you need to have ownership of that. And if you can educate the rest of the team, I think... 
I, I don't think it's enough for you to just say, here's the documentation, read it. I, I think that's tossed way too much. And sometimes documentation has taken me like two to three days just to read it. It's like, you probably could have like condensed some of this and, and, and delivered it. But I, I think my expectation is that developers take the ownership of making sure that the rest of the team is comfortable with what they're introducing. And, they, and if not, they're teaching it. They're taking the next step to actually teach it to the rest of the the developers. Maybe not everyone agrees with me. I know a lot of people, I I don't know if a lot, but I know some people are just like, well, it's your responsibility to to look it up. Like you're a developer for how many, uh, you've been a developer for how many years? Like you you can look this up, you can learn it on your own. It's like, I can, but you're kind of being selfish by introducing this complexity, like, and just like throwing those requirements on us. So that's kind of my mindset behind it. I know I didn't really answer your question, Mark, but those are really just kind of my thoughts about like how to take ownership of introducing that complexity. I, th- I think you answered it. And um, I think probably part of the reason that I'm, I'm more so okay with it is because a part of my team, you know, it's a part of our culture to have regular like lunch and learns is what we call them. Um, where a developer will introduce a technology or, or just something new that they learn while uh, developing the app. Um, and so that it does make the, it does make understanding a lot easier and it, it does provide, not to overuse the word, but it provides a framework with, with which to approach these new, these new concepts. Um, in addition to that, you know, my team also, we, we, everything we do is, uh, with a pair and we, we rotate, we rotate pairs every day, right? So someone who maybe introduced the technology by the by the end of two weeks has paired with every other developer on the team you know so every, so that that knowledge transfer is something that that's a regular part of our flow our daily flow um and so it it, it makes it easier to to learn these technologies yeah and we, we've had that conversation about you pairing constantly we, we've definitely yeah. <laughs> We definitely yeah. talked about it. It's an interesting yeah. concept, and I guess that is one advantage of bringing in pairing developers and, and doing pair pair programming. That's an, yeah, I, I can definitely see you guys not having a lot of silent knowledge. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like I got a question for you guys? Um, and we'll wrap it up in about five minutes. Do you feel like my because I, I I think I almost I have some emotion behind this. I I feel like I have some. Uh, um, reservations behind bringing in complexity. I feel like it should be challenged more than it often is. Do you feel like I am being um, overbearing with it or like too opinionated about it? Or do you feel like I have some merit behind it? I think there's merit 100%. Um, I think that, you know, a part of our apps, like we just we don't just do development, right? We also we also test we we test everything, right? And so when you bring in a new technology, you don't just have to learn the technology; you also have to learn how to test it. You have to learn like the nuances of how like maybe you need to mock a new object, right? And all of that takes time. Um, but then when you think about like, okay, what are what are our objectives for this particular sprint, and how and how much time, like how fast can you all do it, right? Like the more complexity you add, the longer a particular ticket takes, right? Um, not not always, but that's that's one risk. And so I don't I don't think that it's just like a one hundred percent good thing to do it all of the time, and that certain considerations do have to be made. Some of the ones that that you brought up, right? How how easy is it for a new developer to pick it up? Um, and just because you're an experienced developer doesn't mean you don't have gaps, right? Mm-hmm. So you could be like, you know, a senior uh, React developer, and then this this is the year that they introduce hooks. Well, now you have to learn hooks, you, you know? If you didn't know hooks before. <laughs> um, and so, you know, taking your, taking into account those gaps Right, and the other the other aspects of apps that that we have to to work with, I think that it it is like, you know, you do have to think seriously about it. You have to think long term about it, especially. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a good point. I think adding a third party library should probably be kind of the, the last resort option when you're looking at solving a problem. Um, and even then you have to be like certain that not, not only will it like result in a, a better product right now, but also in a month, six months, a year, five years, will it come back to bite you? Has anyone had a third party library come back to bite them? I know I have, but raising this hand. <laughs> okay. All right, so just I don't know yet. Yeah. yeah I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it's one of the hardest it's one of the hardest parts about being a developer because you sort of have to learn to do this really delicate dance between not spending so much time on trying to figure out which dependency to use or which um, you know which technology is going to be best for your application but you get stuck into either option paralysis where you can't figure out what's the best thing to use is or you get stuck into recreating the wheel where you're creating this thing from scratch that other developers are already using or has already been available to you. Um, but on the other hand, you the less time you spend doing that, the more of a risk you're sort of introducing into your application where this may come back to bite you in the future, or maybe you just straight up can't afford to spend all this time looking into all these different technologies, and you have to just pick one and run with it. And I think this is a very real problem for both people in the industry along with junior developers, where you sort of have to you have to identify when is it okay to either settle or just jump headfirst into a technology without running over the other options? And when is it okay to take that time to sit back and figure out what the benefits and drawbacks of each of these options are and what sort of the politics behind these are in terms of how are other developers going to feel about it and how is this going to, what's the community of this like to the point where is it going to be maintained like for the lifespan of my application? Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. I think I think all of you you illustrated well what to really watch out for when it comes to considering third party apps. I think I I think I push this topic so much because it's the one thing I don't like about JavaScript. It's the one thing. Like I I love JavaScript as a language. It's why I stick with it. But the abstractions make the entry point much harder to attain, um, and it's harder to keep up with. I think, I think JavaScript positions are usually compensated to match that, but it's still like, I want, I want more people to love JavaScript. And I feel like there are some things that people within the JavaScript community need to push back on in order to make it more welcoming to even other programmers, other developers that are really good programmers, that are really good developers that um, just hate the messiness of JavaScript and what it brings compared to some of the other languages they might be used to. Um, I don't know. I think this is a good topic. I really like talking about like third party and, and pushing against it. Mm. All of you had really good opinions. Uh, okay. So I think, I think this about wraps up the podcast. I actually want to touch on one more topic, but this is usually how it goes. It's just, we keep talking about just the, the first few topics and we have a really good discussion behind it. And I, I know I, I push you guys, I don't think I gave you a heads up on any of what I was gonna talk about. So yeah, basically put everyone on spot today to just come up with something out of the out of the blue. Um, you guys are very good developers. It shows, I think a lot of people respect your opinions. I've seen that at the meetup. I've seen that at, um, like I've seen that at your company, Catalytic. Um, so it was definitely a pleasure having you on. Uh, before we leave, I'm gonna wrap up. Is there collectively one last piece of advice that we can give for aspiring developers that uh, they're just trying to do a good job? They're just trying to grow as aspiring developers, do what they need to do and love the technology and eventually get that position. What can we come up with? I would say just keep at it. Keep coding, keep working until you've reached that point because code in general is very frustrating. A lot of the times it's it's sort of like arguing with a monkey where you're sitting there, you're telling it to do something and it's refusing to do it, but it's not gonna tell you exactly why 100% of the time. You're just sort of, you have this sort of barrier between you and the computer. So as long as you sort of keep at it and learn what, 
those communication signals are, you learn how to work with the technologies you're using, and you sort of learn this dance of, hey, what can I do with my computer? What can I sort of tackle, and what can't I tackle? Um, you, you, you'll get that job you're looking for. Yeah, I think it's really important to always like keep learning, keep growing your skill set. Um, if you find yourself in a pattern of just using the tools that you're comfortable using, um, and you're you know working on something but you're not really learning anything, then that's kind of a, a waste of time. That's not putting yourself in a position to succeed. Uh, one thing I would suggest is adding this to your goal set, which is um, um, being stuck. Because I think that when we're working on things, we're, we we want to be successful, right? But then, like, there will be a book in our app. We'll, we'll code something that we thought was right, and it, it was wrong. And that can, can lead itself to this feeling of frustration, right? Because you want the thing to work. Um, but especially, you know, when you're working on this project to learn, your goal is actually to find that book, to run into that book. Because the more books you run into, the more the more the more opportunity you have to learn and like break through those books and understand the technology better so it, it almost sounds counterintuitive right but you know that book is really where you learn all really good piece of advice i i agree with everything that you guys just said all right um guys thank you so much for hopping on the podcast it's a pleasure having you um, this will probably get released maybe within a few weeks, but I'll let all of you know. Uh, but seriously, thanks for hopping on this. This really was awesome. Uh, for anyone that's listening or, or watching, if you haven't already, definitely subscribe. Uh, we're going to be doing more open discussions like this. Um, I think Nick, we even have a targeted discussion on, uh, uh, backend developers and, and kind of growth and how to become a, a back-end engineer and what, what that trajectory looks like. So I'm really excited for that one. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for watching the podcast and uh, happy coding, everyone. And for everyone on the podcast right now, thanks so much for joining me. It was a pleasure having you. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much for having us. <laughs>